So basically, tying up everything that you all saw today, um, I'll add to and destroy some and <laughs> create controversy with other things because as we go in biologic dentistry, you're just gonna find out new things all the time and you have to kind of go and change and go with the flow. Uh, but it's been a great educational day so far and uh, let's continue to explore how will all the things you all have talked about today among yourselves and with all the speakers up here, how can we add ozone and complete the dental practice puzzle? Well, 20 some odd years ago when a German trained physician came up to me and told me ozone was gonna cure ear infections naturally without mit out antibiotic. I said, yeah, yeah, right, I've gotta, I've gotta see this. <clears throat> well, then he showed me, and then he showed me scientific stuff, which I don't want to know how to do something. I want to know why I'm doing it, and then show me how to do it. So I want to know the science behind that, which is what attracted me to this academy all those years ago. So let's put the pieces together, because we need every one. And so I think you can cure perio and everything just by swishing with mercury and fluoride every day, right? <laughs> Okay, so, yeah. But, okay. <laughs> so, you want to use comprehensive integrated biologic dental medicine. That's what we really want to do. That's what you're really getting involved with, with this. So, but let's put all these pieces together because we need all of them. And is ozone an important piece? In my practice, I wouldn't practice without it. And I thought I was the last one in the class that day that, that we were taking on how to cure antibiotic resistant infections naturally without antibiotic, uh, I was the last one to actually get treated with it that day with an ear insufflation. But after he treated me with that and we were sitting around eating lunch and they put this stethoscope in your ear and put ozone in there and we were eating lunch in Union Station in Washington DC and I go, Ozone's coming out of me. So what's going on? So the guy sitting next to me, I said, hey, John, see if I smell like ozone to you. He said, I think it's me. <laughs> you think it's you? Yeah. So I leaned over. Yeah, it is you. But no, wait, it's me. Then we have five grown men around this table. We're all smelling each other. <laughs> well, you know, everybody's looking at, well, those are some weird guys. But I go back and I say, hey, what's going on? This And he says, no, no, you don't understand. He said, when you go, ozone went in your ear, tympanic membrane, there's wax in there, and I'm just shortening this up a lot. But he said, here, I'll show you. Smell my finger. And I said, no. <laughs> my dad did. No, my dad did that. No, no, no. So, but he, the Germans really don't care because I got on him about putting the stethoscope in, not sterilizing it, being a germaphobe like I am in OCD. So he said, watch, I'll show you. Like that. And he stuck his finger in my ear. I was like, I haven't had that done since eighth grade. And so, <laughs> you know, so he said, now smell. And I went, oh, it's ozone. So I went, hmm, oh, it's ozone. It's coming out of my ear. So I said, how did that happen? Well, he had a book and showed me how to do it. But that set off a course of events that led me there. And so, but I just couldn't believe that everything he told me that it would do, it would do. And so I started really investigating it, read a bunch of books, can't read German, but he had a couple that were translated into English. And then I went online and started doing a lot of research and found out it did everything he told me, but it did more, you know, because he was only scratching the surface of that. So, uh, so all the information you guys get today, you know, about mercury and fluoride and endo and implants and all of this, when you introduce it into your practice, the information produces a starting point for a paradigm shift in your practice. And this, I guarantee you, will be a pretty good paradigm shift. So what is a paradigm shift? Well, everybody kind of knows. It's the aha moment you have when you look at that and say, well, for ethical patient care, I can use other things in here. You know, what am I going to do? Ozone, I'm not going to use mercury anymore. Oh, endo, if it's done right, is okay. You know, you look at all these things and you say, hmm, uh, that's interesting. So the aha moment is uh, an epiphany. You know, you get an attitude shift. And that's what happened to me because I thought this guy lecturing to me wasn't very smart. 
because he didn't speak English that I could understand with my Kentucky accent, you know. I kept saying, what was that again, doctor? What was that again? What was that again? He said, do you have a hearing problem? I said, no, you have an enunciation. No, that's not. But anyway, <laughs> the aha moment is a wake-up call and open experiencing. Learning you can think inside and outside the box, but once you get in this group, they're in the box. You guys aren't in any kind of box because all of the people in here think outside of it and we don't even recognize it anymore. So old ways really won't open new doors. So the new way of ozone treatment opens the doors to integrated biologic dental medicine. And this in turn opens the doors to new areas of therapy to help you deliver more comprehensive and this is what I'm really concerned about, ethical care to your patients. Because I have so many people come into the practice from these, you know, I mean, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but I do all the time anyway, so I'll go ahead. But the, co the corporate type of practices, you know, somebody comes in, I've got, I need 15 fillings. Yeah. You do? And three crowns. You do? Yeah. So, hmm. Do you have insurance? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, but... All these people come in and then when we, but I tell them when they come in, they want a second opinion. I said, I don't want to know anything. Don't tell me anything about the uh, first opinion you got. Just let me look at you. And then if they've got x-rays, fine. If they don't, you know, we'll pop a couple digitals on them and pop them up and let them look at them. And then I'll say, okay, I can see a few in here, maybe, some maybes, but where did, what, and so they then give me a treatment plan that they got from one of those places, and it's a pretty good treatment plan, but I'm not going to do that because it's not, it's not an ethical thing to do for the patient. I mean, okay, they can replace a filling every three to five years and still get paid for it. They can replace a crown every five years and still get paid for it. Yeah, but is that ethical? So I just like to show them this then, and so what I do with the patient is, and they say, well, I'm here because I know you do things differently. Okay, and I know I'm walking out of the camera thing, but I can't help that. So uh, this is uh, an ozone machine that we use. I can get it, there we go. And um, so, let's turn it on here. And so if you're going to kill everything Everything down the patient's mouth. Everything in a, in a carious lesion. Show you here. So you take, this is in my operatories. We got this. So in, this is medical grade oxygen. There's a tube in here, a plasma arc tube that's made out of quartz. In England and all of the European countries, you can't use an ozone machine unless uh, it, unless it just doesn't touch anything except kynar, quartz, or silicone. And there are a lot of machines that are sold that aren't like that. Problem is it puts toxins into you. So this machine, and see if we got everything set up here. So if we're going to sterilize a tooth for a patient, we will set this in there. And then Rhonda or... Amanda or Jackie, when we finish prepping, we'll run and get this. So that's a syringe full of ozone gas. Okay, doesn't look like anything, right? So, latex glove, ozone gas. You can put it in your ear, kills all the infection. You can put it on your skin, doesn't hurt you. You can put it in your mouth, you can't breathe it. But when you put it on latex, Okay, now that's just a tiny little bit on there. This is 15,000 times thicker than most bacterial cell membranes. Okay, now if it does that to latex, it'll do it to nitrile too. It takes just a little bit longer, but it'll do it to nitrile. That's why a lot of the endodontists hate it until they get used to using it because it blows their dam. Okay, as long as they hold suction there while they're doing this, it's okay. But you can wait that long and say, how long are you keeping the syringe? Well, you can keep it in there. Depends on what the, your original setting is, but it's been there for a few minutes. You can see again, I'm just putting out little bitty squirts of it. Just pops a hole right through the latex. So, 
Do I care what organism is in the mouth? No, it's going to kill them all. Okay, so, and do I want to use antibiotics for perio disease? No, I don't use antibiotics for anything. I can get away with it. My two youngest daughters have never had an antibiotic in their life. When they got ear infections or anything uh, that was like tonsil problems and all that, I have them gargle with ozone water. We put ozone in their ears and inject the tonsils with ozone. There's a bunch of stuff you can do with this. Now, we're not going to be able to cover all that, obviously, or my slides would look like <laughs> we have 5,000 slides and you can't cover them all. So um, I don't know what I did with my little clicker. So anyway, but uh, let's go next. Oh, did I lay down up here? Oh, there, good. Thanks. I'll turn this off so we'll not hear all that stuff. So now I use a medical oxygen tank in my office. That's an oxygen concentrator. Getting oxygen tanks anymore when we go out and lecture like this, it's really tough. And since all the COVID stuff and everything, you just can't get the people to deliver them. So we just used ozone. So now the question is, how did I make it? Well, I needed an energy source. It's in that box. That's a high voltage tube in there. And that tube will last for the lifetime, your lifetime, because it's only running at 10% of its power. So that's, 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 the, that's a really, really great unit. So how do we create it? Well, we need oxygen, so I made oxygen in that little machine, or you can use a green cylinder, which I use in my office. And you need an energy source, that's electricity. And then what happens is that electricity breaks the normal diatomic oxygen into two singlet oxygens, and they reform transiently with diatomic oxygen to form O3. That's what ozone is, O3. So what makes that work then? So if we have ozone, why do we need ozone in our dental procedures anyway? Because it kills everything in the mouth, in a cavity prep, on a crown prep, in a perio pocket, it, in, down in endo, like Griff showed you in the endo. It, it just kills it. It oxidizes it, burns it up. Okay, like Dr. Gosweiler was saying earlier about the oxidation reduction reaction. He said, none of you can leave the room today until you fill out a total Krebs cycle with all the enzymes. So I'm sorry, but you know, that's just him. He's, he's the consummate teacher uh, university wise. So here's, so why do we need ozone? Okay, what's ozone do? Well, ozone will break apart and it puts a singlet oxygen out, which breaks this bacterial cell membrane down. When it breaks the bacterial cell membrane down, that's called lysis, it breaks it down. So you got your bacteria plus ozone, it lyses it, and all the contents of that bacteria fall out, and guess what else it does? It kills the DNA of the bacteria it can't reproduce. The virus, say, same, it breaks a capsid down on the virus, can't reproduce, it breaks their DNA down. Chops the strands up. So. That's why we need it. And this is what it looks like in my office. The same unit here, right here, we have an oxygen tank. And this is what I would recommend if you, uh, in the office. I mean, this works, but the problem with this is you can't use it for other things. So the oxygen concentrator is okay. But sunlight makes ozone, lightning makes ozone, and you need electricity. But you need that energy source to split that diatomic oxygen. Now, the diatomic oxygen forms triatomic oxygen, ozone, only very transiently. So when you put that in a cavity prep, it, tur it turns it chalky white. I've got some pictures to show. And when that happens, ozone's gone. It's gone in nanoseconds, and it changes to a peroxide. So, but you have to scavenge in case you put it on too fast. You don't want it coming out because it will make you cough. So where's the science of this? Well, properties of ozone, and this is something that he showed me, and I was like, this is crazy. What? Outside the body, it's a powerful oxidizer, like a redox reaction. So it kills bacteria, fungus, and viruses at lower concentrations than chlorine. It takes one molecule of ozone to kill the same number of bacteria. It takes three to 10,000 molecules of chlorine to kill. And it kills them 3,500 times faster. Now, see, my math brain goes, like, you know, that, 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 that was really hard for me. So, and this is also on the, I've 
took off of some of the slides that he had. It also burns up, oxidizes phenolics, poisonous compounds of methanol, wood alcohol, benzene, pesticides, detergents, chemical manufacturing waste, and aromatic compounds more rapidly and effectively than chlorine, but it doesn't leave any trihalomethanes behind, which means there's no cancer-causing chemicals left behind there. So uh, how does it do that? And so I, my brain went, what? Wait, only one molecule is equal to three to 10,000 molecules of chlorine, 35. I, I said, I, I can't, I couldn't wrap my scientific left brain much around that. So I have a nephew who's really smart and he's a biochemist. And so I said, hey, Brett, how are you at regression curves? He said, well, I was pretty good at them in school. I said, well, dust them off. So we worked on this. So here's what we came up with. Okay, if you take two glasses and you put 4,500 bacteria in one and 4,500 bacteria in the other, you put in 4,500 molecules of chlorine and you put in one molecule of ozone and the total kill time is 3,500 seconds for the bacteria and it's one second, I mean for the chlorine, it's one second for the ozone. Okay, so that spurred his interest also, because he's pretty OCD like me. It all comes from my mother, so we can blame her on that. But she was the chemist and the biochemist in my family. And so this is what happens. It's oxidation. It's kind of a busy slide, but let's follow it. Oxidation, we're going to burn something up. Rapid oxidation is fire. Slow oxidation is rust, like Dr. Gosweiler showed you with that rusting teeter-totter slide thing. Metabolic oxidation is digestion. What do you do to your calories? Do you freeze them? Do you put them over on the side? What do you do with them? No, you burn them up. How do you burn calories? You can't burn anything without oxygen. So if you eat a big meal and go to bed and you don't get enough oxygen at night or you hold your breath, you have sleep apnea, why do you get a weight gain? You can't burn up all those calories. So what happens? The body says, I don't know what to do with this. Let's go store it somewhere. So that's why you see a lot of the people in sleep apnea cases that you know, are overweight. A lot of them weren't overweight when they, when they were diagnosed with sleep apnea, but it works, to, you know, it works badly on that. But let's see, oxidation here, as I digress. So we add ozone here. Now you just saw there's a cell membrane, like the latex glove. It breaks a hole in it. It starts attacking it on the, there, and it breaks it down. And these little yellow and blue things are lipoperoxides and hydroperoxides, because what's a cell membrane made out of? Lipoprotein, okay? Guess what? These are all toxic to the bacteria next to it. So it's like you light this tree on fire and the fire burns up and catches everything next to it on fire. So how does this work? And I've got a couple slides in here so you guys can go over and look at it again. But uh, what happens there is you can see there's a single bond right here, okay? so. The ozone is made of O3, but you've got this strong double bond here of diatomic oxygen. This is weak. This is negatively charged, and this is what makes it work. Bacteria, viruses, parasites, uh, all of these things, fungi, they're all positively charged. So the ozone is electrochemically attracted to that, and when it does, it releases that singlet oxygen which blows a hole in the, in the bacterial cell membrane, or the virus, or the fungus, or whatever, and it explodes it. And what's left? Water and some lipohydroperoxide stuff. So you don't have any toxic byproducts. You throw chlorine or bromine or something on that, you got all these toxic byproducts left. With ozone, no, you don't. When they had the Olympics in uh, Los Angeles, I forget what rear it is now, it's on one of the slides that I have in the ozone lecture, but. Uh, all the Russians and the East Germans walked in, they said, we're not swimming in this toxic cesspool with chlorine. They rip all the chlorinators off of the pools and they've replaced them with ozonators. The Olympics are over, they rip all the ozonators off the pool and replace them with chlorinators. It's because chlorine is easier to handle because it lasts in the water. Ozone's a point of use thing. You use it, you make it, you use it, and it's done, okay? so. So this is what's happening and why it works so fast. It's called lipid peroxidation. And this little emblem up here is from Ed, the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And so this is where they did this study. I try to get studies from everywhere and incorporate them so I'm, we're not just using one source of information. 
Okay? So what happens is all of these free radicals, and I like biochem and I could get crazy on this, but we're not, we're gonna just skip over all that and we'll go right down to here. This is lipid peroxide. And so what happens is the electron transfer, and like you heard Gossweiler say, it's the terminal electron acceptor in biologic reactions. When that electron transfers, guess how fast it's going? It's light speed, and guess what? It generates a chain reaction, and that chain reaction is a biologic light speed self-catalyzed chain reaction. It just keeps going until it runs out of substrate, bacteria, virus, fungus, parasite. When it runs out of those, it's done. Doesn't make any more. So it's going at 670,616,629 miles per hour. And that's how it goes that fast. So why is it toxic to microbes? When you expose the bacteria to the negative charge of the, of the, of the oxygen molecule here, and it goes into the positive charge of the bacteria, it breaks them down. They literally explode. The healthy cells are left undefected because of their protective enzyme coating and only, by, only byproducts of harmless oxygen. So Dr. Gosweiler didn't get into that where he said he was doing some stuff with that. But what happens is when you're born, you take your first breath and you're alive and you start dying because oxygen is a life giver, but it's a life taker because 95% of the oxygen that you're taking in right now is used for bodily reactions in your mitochondria, oxidative phosphorylation. It's used in all kinds of reactions. 5% of that goes into free radicals because it has to tweak your immune system all over the place to get you to make your endogenous antioxidant enzymes, catalase, glutathione, peroxidase, those things. The exogenous stuff we take, vitamin C, uh, e, and like um, alpha lipoic acid, we take those, those are exogenous. We make our own and they're in the cells. And so that's why you can put ozone in your ear like I just did, on your skin, you can put it anywhere, as long as you don't put it in your eyes or breathe it directly because you don't have good antioxidant enzymes there because you have to exchange gases with the environment. If we had high antioxidant enzymes, we couldn't exchange gases in our eyes, we wouldn't be able to see, and we definitely wouldn't be able to get oxygen into our system through the alveoli of the lungs. So those two things are the only thing you have to worry about when you use ozone. And of course, it's pretty simple to, to protect the patient with that. So you have an oxidizable substance, then you have the ozone, there's your weak bond right there, and it'll do anything. I mean, it'll break down algae, it just breaks down everything that has a positive charge which, guess what, is bad for us. Positive charge, infection, inflammation, cancer, they're all, they're all acidic events carrying a positive charge, okay? So, are you ready for a practical paradigm shift for operative dentistry? Because we've given you a lot of like, let's cure perio and let's do this and let's do that, and then you've got to look at all these different weird things. I'm gonna show you the practical side of it. Uh, you know, we're gonna we'll talk about operative. You know, don't look back, look ahead. Because um, here's what ahead, here's what's ahead. How to perform integrated bi biologic restorative dentistry. Now, I did this before COVID ever came out, okay? We have the patient rinse with ozonated water. Guess what? I'm not getting any kind of aerosol when I blow my three-way syringe in because the water in my, in my units is ozonated water. The water, in the piezos and the ultrasound, sonics for the hygienist, ozonated water. They're, we're getting ozonated water all over. But I have the, the patients rinse with it first because they know that they're having their teeth done by somebody that's a little on the weird side who makes them do this stuff, you know? And so, and then, so, and then we give them anesthesia and uh, then we prep the tooth uh, and we have ozone water in the unit water bottles. Then we put ozone gas, the stuff I blew the latex glove with, right on the prep, okay? And I'll show you guys how to do that. And then yeah, normal etch, seal it and composite, you know, and then I put two to three milliliters of ozone in the injection site following the filling because what is holding that anesthesia together? 
a double bond. If you use an amide bond, you know, whether you're using carbocane or septo or whatever, it chops that bond off and you lose anesthesia really fast and your liver doesn't have to break it down. It can be broken down locally by local tissue cholinesterases and you don't, you don't put a burden on, on the liver with somebody like that. And it's just real simple. You, okay, I'm finished with the prep. Pop it in there, okay? Uh, I, sometimes I don't, I mean, a lot, of time, a lot of things I say me, I mean Amanda or Jackie or, or my hygienist, because hygienist injects a lot for me. Uh, so, but this breaks down into the compounds better tolerated by the liver, similar to the older type of Novocaine, which was an oxygen bond holding it together. Cocaine and uh, Novocaine are related because they're both ester bonds. So they break down very fast, 15 to 30 minutes in the tissue because tissue cholinesterases break them down. We found a way to make it last longer by making an amide bond and then by putting a little bit of epi in there with it. So, uh, but I use primarily carbocane 3%. I get an hour and a half to three anesthesia with that. And if I can't get something done in that time, you know, there's something wrong. Now some people need more, you know, we'll have to give them a little bit more because they'll break it down a little faster, especially if they hadn't anything to eat or anything. So what we did, you saw me fill that syringe up there with gas. So here's what we do. We prep the tooth, so we fill it with gas. Okay, so there's a syringe. It's got a global composite tip on there. Okay, and this is a 14-year-old male, deep carious lesion. You can see down here, uh, you can pull that. You'll get these slides, you know, from IOMT, so you can look. But down here, it's really dark down in here. There's a real dark spot down in there. And you put ozone on there, and that's how you do it. Just stick the syringe in there and flow a composite tip. See the saliva ejector it's holding right there? That's scavenging everything out there. You don't have to worry about it, but there's a flowable, there's the flowable composite tip down in the prep, okay? And so then this is initial ozone disinfection, and this is a class five. You can see it a little bit better. But uh, there's, the, there's the saliva ejector there again. And see the color of that? I don't know how well you can, that shows up on there. That's not bad, but look at it now. You, it just looks like you acid etch it. I mean, when you do that, I see that all the time. And I'm still going like, that's really cool how that does that. Because then you know you're filling a sterile tooth. What causes recurrent decay? I was such a hot shot when I got out of dental school and I went in the army and I was like, uh, you know, there's nobody better at me than operative dentistry. You know, I'm, I'm the gift, you know, I've the, keeps on giving, you know. And so I've been in practice 12 years, 15 years, and I'm going, ha, look at this bite wing x-ray, some slob left decay under this, under this filling. And I go pull the chart up, let's see, when did, oh, that slob was me. What? <laughs> And then I started seeing decay under sealants. How's that happen? Well, we're sealing in decay under those sealants. And I, I didn't leave decay under those. Okay. I, mean, I, taught, I taught operative at, at, at Louisville's School of Dentistry. I mean, I didn't leave decay under there, but I left bacteria in the tubules. That's where our problem is, whether it's operative whether it's endo, it's the tubules. You've got to get those things sterilized. So if all the, car if all the carriage was removed, how'd that happen? Well, this is why it happens. You've got these tubules and they've got, I mean, it looks like, you know, a massive big tunnel for these bacteria to run around in. And so there you go with your acidic positive charge here. We put ozone in there and it, boom, it'll run down in there. Now, this is from Chicago. Uh, this is a research center up there. These are bacteria forming a biofilm. See all the stringy stuff? And, and that when he talked about quorum sensing and all of that, that's how, bi that's how biofilm happens. And, but look at when they put ozone on there. See them breaking down? See the little pieces falling out? It causes osmotic bursting. And ozone continues to oxidize enzymes and DNA. So, and we used this day in and day out during that, the weird COVID thing because it just it knocks that stuff out. That's nothing for it. So this is uh, cytoplasmic extensions from dent producing adonoblasts. The ozone gas destroys any microbes and oxidizes, burns the organic components of the tubules 
and ablates the tubules. So when we ablate that, we're oxidatively sealing off those tubules. And ablation is a medical dental procedure. It removes a layer of tissue either by surgery or less invasive techniques like ozone. Way less invasive. No. And you can use lasers to go around the gum line like we talked about earlier. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to do like, I, I usually send them out to my periodontist because he's really slick. And especially if I get somebody that's got hypertrophied gingiva from years in ortho treatment, you know, and it's all fibrotic. I just send them over to Matt and Matt takes and does a nice scalloping effect. And well, why don't you do it yourself? Well, one, I don't have a laser. Two, I'm really, really busy. And three, if something does go wrong, it's his fault. And so, <laughs> that's why. Why do you usually? Why do you use that? Well, it's because I it's, because it's, it's his fault. So why is oxidation important when using ozone gas on teeth? Well, before ozone, that's what it looks like. Okay, in there. Now, after I put ozone on there, look, where'd that come from? Where'd this come from? Where'd this come from? Okay, it shows that. Now it's going to penetrate one and a half to two milliliters of intact dentin and kill anything that's that deep. Now a lot of times I get in there and I see blushing dentin and you know what that does to you. It makes your external anal sphincter get a little tighter and I go like, yeah, okay, here's what we're going to do. I got a deal for you here. Let's do indirect pulp therapy. Do you want me to have send you to get a root canal done? No, I don't want root canals. Okay, well, we have to get the tooth extracted or we can do indirect pulp therapy. How do you do that? We put ozone on it, kill everything, and then we put a sedative dressing in there and let it remineralize and heal. How long do I have to do it? Eh, three to six months, I don't know. But you get about 75 to 80% okay then, because as, as, the, as long as the pulp's not infected badly, it will heal. It, it, the pulp, the pulps can heal if they if if they can. So, uh, so you get an oxidative ablation of all the micro, of all the microbes in the in the tubules, and then uh, that's a picture of that you saw before. But uh, here's the thing: when you put this on here, and then you put your etch and sealant, you're you're effectively sealing these tubules. The first root canal done in Louisville, the first one done with ozone, was on my wife, tooth number three. Very good friend of mine, his dad taught me in dental school. I said, Brian, I want you to do endo on number three. She fractured off, she's got pulp exposure. He said, okay, I said, but I want you to use ozone on it. I don't know how to do it. I know you don't, I'm gonna show you. So we went over there and we did that on her and that was in 1998, okay, it's still fine. And so, uh, and he came to the first course that I ever taught on ozone in 2001 in Louisville in my office. And he was, I invited him to come. So he said, they were halfway through one of the lectures. He said, Bob, could I say something here? And I was like, uh oh, I said something wrong because he's going, you know, what did I, what was that? And I said, sure, Brian, you know, here. He said, well, I want to tell you all, I thought this was the goofiest thing I'd ever heard. And it's been three years now. And I've been doing it. And I can tell you, every tooth that we have ozone on, when I look down there with my microscope, it's pristine. And that was just his words, pristine. And uh, Val Cantor, uh, who teaches the ozone and the lasers and all the pips and sweeps and all that stuff, she said pretty much the same thing when she started using it, how clean the, how clean the canals looked after ozone. So now you've got a dilemma. You know all this stuff now. Can you keep it to yourself? So what treatment should you offer your patient? You know, uh, well, there's ethical considerations. You've got to respect what a patient wants. I don't want the root canal. I want to get it extracted. Okay. Uh, does that harm him? Well, maybe, I don't know. You know, and that, well, I'd rather have an implant. Okay, you can get an implant. Uh, but just do good treatment. Be fair and always tell them the truth. If, you're, if you hit the nerve in there, don't go like, oh, and they come back, oh, my tooth is killing me. Yeah, well, it's pretty deep. We'll send you a good endo. I always tell them, hey, we're really close, or we really hit it, or whatever, and we'll show them with a camera or something, show them you know, what's going on. Uh, but just assess what's going on, communicate it with the patient, and decide. Would you do this on your family or yourself? And I offer that to the patient because I tell them, look, when you're a patient here, you do, you're de facto family. Okay, your family member. 
Now, if you want to divorce your family and go to another dentist, I'm good with that. <laughs> but that's just the way it is. And so can dental ozone be an asset to the patient's health, a detriment to the patient's health, an asset to the dental team's health? Yes, because we're killing all the aerosol that we used to breathe. One of our hygienists, Allison, she gets sick all the time. 20 years ago, she's hardly sick at all anymore, you know, once we started doing this in the water bottles. So can we eliminate dental infections? And can we eliminate dental aerosols? Yes. Yes. And what about, with your new knowledge, can you ethically justify using mercury or fluoride? The choice not to eliminate aerosols, the choice not to disinfect extraction sites, this really works well in extraction sites. The choice is not to dis disinfect tooth preparations. When Dr. Goswell and I met, because he teaches at Indiana University, I was getting all these people from Indianapolis to treat with um, implant, peri-implantitis. Because I treated one person up there with peri-implantitis, then all of a sudden, the floodgates opened. So I went up, we taught a couple of courses up there. Dr. Gosweiler was there at one, Dr. Uh, Reese, Ted Reese was there. And so after they got trained, that was great. I didn't have all these people flooding down from Indy to get their implants, failing implants. And, and it really does a wonderful job on implants, especially if you use it when you're putting the implant in, whether you guys do implants or not. I don't, I let my periodontist do them. Um, so the dilemma, do you pre present your next treatment plan and inform the patients of the changes that you're now offering to them or is it more of the same ahead? You know, I mean, this is the thinking in the corporate dental offices. You know, just do it like we've always done it. And we don't care if it falls apart in three to five years because the insurance kicks back in and we'll get paid for it again. That's, I just don't like that. So I said, well, how long should a crown last? How long should a root canal last? I was a sophomore in 1968. I did a first reeking out ever, ever on my aunt. Then I did a full gold crown that I waxed up myself and cast and put on her. Guess what? It's still on there. The reeking out is still fine. Silver points in the buckle canal and <laughs> got a perch in the distal. You know, I mean, it, it took five appointments to get the root canal checked off before we had it disinfected. And we were using all kinds of stuff. And you, I didn't tell the the instructor at the time, but I said, why aren't we using peroxide down in here? Oh no, we're gonna use uh, sodium hypochlorite. And you know, I'm like, okay, so, and it kept coming back infected. And so I finally, I rinsed it out, I put hydrogen peroxide in both canals and cultured it, it came back negative. And Billy uh, uh, Meyer, who is who's checking me out, comes up and says, see Harris, just do what I told you and everything will work out right. Just keep using that. Oh, okay, okay, I got it, Dr. Yeah, I got it, Dr. Meyer. So <clears throat> let's investigate what we can provide to patients as biologic dentists, okay? Um, this is on my uh, informed consent, the definition of dentistry. I guarantee you nobody on your state board knows this, okay? This is the ADA. Defined as the evaluation, diagnosis, prevention, and our treatment, non-surgical, surgical, or related procedures of diseases, disorders, and our conditions of the oral cavity, maxillofacial area, and or the adjacent and associated structures, and their impact on the human body. That gives you a pretty broad thing. Provided by a dentist within the scope of his or her education, training, and experience in accordance with the ethics and profession and applicable law. Nobody knows that. But that's a pretty broad definition of what we're allowed to do. My advice is don't get crazy, you know. Stay above the clavicles and you'll never have a problem. So, <laughs> yeah, because there have been guys that do this kind of, yo, I can handle that breast cancer for you. Okay, yeah. And I mean, I'm serious. I'm, that's, you know, there were several people that got all fired up about that because they're doing it in Germany. They inj inject solid tumors with those. So why are we here? Well... We want to learn new techniques, emerging technologies, and, you know, get entertained sometimes. And dental pearls, what everybody wants from a CE course, this is what we've learned since 1999, where you can use ozone. And we have a two-day course that we go over all this stuff in. General dentistry, caries arrestment, reduction of root sensitivity. If you did nothing other than those, the patients are crazy happy with you. 
perio, soft tissue management, endo, oral surgery, perioimplantitis, bile film in your water lines. You don't have to clean your water lines anymore. You don't have to use all those chemicals in your water lines. Just not needed. And reduction of aerosols for you in your practice. So what can be done safely and biologically to treat these conditions? It's just simple. It's too simple. Ozone water and ozone gas. I mean, I know this is Occam, Occam's razor. You know, it's the simplest solution. So here's one thing. If you want to sell somebody on ozone and they've got root surface sensitivity, it's an abfraction. It's sensitive to cold, hot, air, temperature, brushing, touch. Hate it. I can't eat ice cream. Well, there's a multiple etiology on this. They can be clenching. They can be bruxing. They might need a night guard. Uh, they can have bow, bow corrosion because they're doing, you know, lemons, sucking on lemons and all this stuff. You know, okay, all of that stuff. But guess what? I don't care. We're going to put ozone on it. So here's your, here's your exposed roof sensitivity. Now, we'll tell you, if, you don't, if it is bruxism and you don't make them night guard, they'll, it'll come back because you'll get continued recession. Okay? But... If you do this that day, right there, and we did it at Griff's office, <laughs> one of the course I taught down there. Was it your hygienist or who was it that? Oh, okay. So she hadn't eaten ice cream in five years. So we said, okay, let's do, let's do you. So we did her and she, we blew air and everything. She get going like that shit. It doesn't hurt. I said, it's not supposed to. So we're out eating dinner that night and we ordered her a bowl of ice cream. And she says, oh, well, oh, my gosh. Then she ordered herself another bowl of ice cream. <laughs> so, uh, so we just fill a syringe up with ozone. You go up on the root surface. You test it with air, cold water, so they know you got your baseline. Dry it with a cotton roll. Fill the syringe with ozone gas. And slowly flow the gas. And slowly. You're going to do it for 45 seconds to a minute. And then do it again. Do it at least two to three times before you recheck it. Sometimes you gets it on the first time, but, you know, that's cheap. And the reason that I say two to three times is I'm not doing it. I've got 15 minutes left. I'm done. So we're good. So, uh, and recheck the sensitivity. And they say, what sensitivity? You know, and there you go. So, uh, so this is the beginning of the end, I hope, of the way you previously practiced dentistry. Because if you make the changes that you learn at this academy, it'll change your life and your patients will love you for it. And that's just, that's the way it's been. It's always been. And the perio stuff that people talk about, you know, we talk about that in the course a lot. But it's not just the back. It's not the bacteria. I mean, it's the response to the bacteria. And it is an autoimmune response. And it involves... T regulatory lymphocytes and TH17 lymphocytes. And what happens is when you have that biofilm in the pocket, and this is why I care, I don't care what, I don't care what species it is, I'm gonna kill it. Okay? Not only that, when you put ozone in a perio pocket, I didn't tell you, but ozone when it's absorbed, either injected subcutaneously or absorbed through the through the tissues. With a, pair, with a tray that we use, it releases nitric ox oxide locally. So what's nitric oxide do? It's a vasodilator. Well, how do you cure all this stuff? Well, like Gosweiler said, it's a hypoxic situation. Oh, there's not enough oxygen. Well, what if we put supercharged oxygen there in ozone and then not only supercharge that oxygen, but then cause a localized delivery of nitric oxide? Then the blood flows in there, and then you get the red blood cells carrying more oxygen. Bingo. You know, so you, it, works, it works really well on everything you can think of in dentistry. There's, the only thing this doesn't work well on is cysts. And I've gotten some cysts to resolve, but it took 15, 20 injections. And most patients burn out after that. You know, and so uh, and even if you nucleate the cyst and you put ozone in there and then you go back... There's, you know, nothing works 100% of the time, but this is pretty darn close. So, and I didn't go into anything with the ear insufflation, nasal, and all that kind of stuff that we did on all the COVID patients. But we do it on the patients for sinuses and for TMJ issues. 
Because you put ozone in the ears like I did. There's a petrotympanic fissure there, and through the petrotympanic fissure runs a discomaleolar ligament. So that ligament runs from the TM joint disc through the petrotympanic fissure into the inner ear and inserts in the malleus bone. So that's how infections will get from behind the eardrum and into the inner ear. That's the same way ozone will get in there. It follows that same pathway. It goes right and follows that right to the petrotympanic fissure. So a lot of people come in with TMD issues. I don't even know they have TMD issues a lot of times. And they'll come back, hey, you know that thing you did on my ears last time to see if I had uh, that uh, sensitive tooth? Yeah. Is it supposed to make my joint pain better? Well, I don't know. Did it make your joint pain better? Well, yeah. I said, well, yeah, then you know, it's supposed to make your joint pain better. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, yeah. And, and anything that ozone happens with ozone, it's supposed to happen because it goes where it's, goes where it needs to go. It's gonna go in the electrochemical charge of where it wants to go. So if you've got an infection here, a lot of times you'll inject over here and you don't know there's an occult infection over here with an old endo tooth. They'll feel the ozone run across the midline, the gas, if you're injecting above a tooth over here. They'll feel that. They did a study in Spain where they infected a dog's leg on the left side. They injected ozone on the right side. In three seconds, ozone molecules showed up in the dog's leg over here in the form of ozonides. But it, it goes where the infection is.